Are you having problems with bed adhesion? Are you tired of your prints failing partway through because they became unstuck? Are you not even making it through your first layer? Well, you're in luck because today we're taking a look at the physics of bed adhesion. And I've got a process sure to get you guys back on the right track. Oh, and if you've ever tainted your build surface with glue or tape, then you can find forgiveness and save your soul from eternal damnation by repenting in the comment section below. I know you're watching, James. Okay, so as you guys know, today we're going to be talking all about bed adhesion, and we're really going to be taking a scientific look at bed adhesion, all right? I'm not just going to give you guys, like, here are the temperatures that work for me, and here's maybe some pointers. We're going to talk about, like, what is the physics that underpins bed adhesion? And beyond that, how can we apply the scientific method to actually dialing in the settings for not just your printer, but also your particular spool of filament? Because the unfortunate truth is that Everyone who sells PLA filament is really selling a slightly different product because they're all using slightly different additives, which can sometimes give the filament wildly different characteristics. So yeah, I'm not just gonna fix this problem once for you guys. The goal is to make this a reference video that really underpins that fundamental part of 3D printing. Um, so in order to do that, I'm going to break the video up into three parts. All right, the first part is going to be theory and fundamentals, where, like I said, we're just going to talk theory and physics. It's going to be relatively short, but it's really important. Um, so if you don't exactly know what's going on during bed adhesion, and in particular, if you don't know what a glass transition means, stick around for that. Uh, the second part is probably going to be the meat of the video, which is going to be dialing in your first layer. This is that process I was talking about where we really dial in the first layer of the print for your specific printer and for your specific filament. I actually have a preset for every single spool of filament that I commonly use. So that's probably going to be the meat of the video. And then after that, I am going to leave you guys with a couple tips and tricks as to like what you can do to start troubleshooting bed adhesion should you have a really, really solid first layer and you continue to have problems in layers after that. It's a pretty rare case and there's only a handful of things that I know of that can go wrong there and I'm going to try to cover all of them. But yeah, the majority of this video is going to be talking about theory and talking about that first critical layer. So with that, uh, let's jump right into theory. Okay, so I'd like to get started with some theory so that when we go to actually talk about the procedure, it makes a little bit more of intuitive sense and you guys know what's going on behind the scenes. And all we really need to know to get started is that bed adhesion is a function of four things. All right, we have bed cleanliness, bed levelness, nozzle temperature, and bed temperature. The first two are pretty straightforward, right? Like clean and level pretty much mean the same thing to everyone. We're all shooting for the same thing. Even if your 3D printer has some really weird way of cleaning or leveling, we're all aiming for a build surface that is free of contaminants like dirt, dust, and oil. And we are all aiming for that build surface to remain a fixed distance away from the nozzle within each individual layer, right? Like that's a pretty universal thing. So I'm gonna focus pretty much the entire rest of this section on nozzle temperature and bed temperature and ex on really understanding what they do. Um, because the really interesting thing is that unlike clean and level, I shoot for a nozzle temperature of 225 and a bed temperature of 60, and that might not even work for you. And if it does work for you, it might not work well for you. And that's why I said earlier in the video that I wasn't just going to give you guys the settings that work for me, leave you with some tips and move on with life, because if you actually understand what you're doing and you understand the process for dialing these things in, then you'll be able to find the ideal settings, not just for your 3D printer, but for every specific spool of filament that you use, which is what I do. Um, and it works really, really, really well. So to understand why nozzle temperature and bed temperature aren't the same for everyone, there's really kind of three different categories of deviation. The first one is just tolerances on your 3D printer, right? So like the temperature sensor and the heating element in the nozzle, might be slightly different on everyone's 3D printer because manufacturing isn't perfect. Um, and this is a relatively small source for error, but it can be noticeable. The good news is that as we iterate and you follow through this process on your 3D printer, it all kind of washes out, right? Like it doesn't matter if your sensor is reading five degrees hotter than it actually is. 
you'll end up with an answer that just happens to compensate for that because you're using your printer. Now, if you were to give that answer to someone else, it might not work for them because their tolerance might be different, but that's pretty negligible, thankfully. The second category is like material variance, right? So this is the fact that when you buy PLA, you're not buying pure PLA, you're buying PLA with additives. Um, and every manufacturer puts in slightly different additives and slightly different quantities of those additives to give their PLA slightly more ideal 3D printing characteristics, which means that they all have slightly different settings, all right? Like that's probably the biggest source of error. Um, but if we understand PLA, we can understand how to overcome that. The third one is just gonna be environmental factors. And I'm just gonna call this random physics bullshit. And we're going to put it in this bag over here and we're just gonna put it over there, all right? Just forget about it, out of sight, out of mind. I I've been through high school level physics and college level physics. And if there's one thing that they've taught me, it's that air resistance doesn't matter ever. So we're going to also be ignoring air resistance in this video. So to really talk about what PLA is, especially in the context of nozzle temperature and bed temperature, we need to talk about what state of matter it typically exists in while we work with it. And that is the state of matter called amorphous solids, um, also known as glasses. And unsurprisingly, the most common example of an amorphous solid is the glass window pane that is at least sitting right next to me and you probably have at least one or two in the room that you're in. And these amorphous solids exhibit some really key and defining characteristics. These are things like being really sticky and being soft and very easily deformed. And even under the right conditions, they can even become a little bit runny like syrup or honey. And they're really thick, but it's really interesting to compare them to more traditional liquids like water. So water pretty much has a thickness, right? It has some amount of resistance to it. And that resistance is pretty much fixed, right? Like you don't get into an ice bath and go, ooh, this is like really soupy and gelatinous. And you don't get into a hot tub and go, oh, hey, this is just super light and I can run through it. Like water is always pretty much the same. And that is not how amorphous solids behave, right? Amorphous solids change thickness and viscosity constantly as you change their temperature, right? So as you increase their temperature, they get thinner and thinner and thinner. And as you decrease the temperature, they get thicker and thicker and thicker and you can kind of just control how thick they are with temperature. And that's exactly what you're doing with nozzle temperature, right? So the whole point of nozzle temperature is that you're controlling the thickness of the filament as it comes out of the nozzle. And on one end of the spectrum, if you have the nozzle temperature too low, then the filament isn't gonna spread out. It's kind of just gonna beat up on the print bed and it's not gonna have very much surface area with the print bed because it's mostly sitting on top of it and it might not even touch like the strands that are next to it. And you might end up with gaps in between the passes. And on the other end of the spectrum, once you have it too hot, it's gonna spread out too much and it's gonna warp and deform, partly because the hotter it is, it expands more like a normal solid does. But on top of that, like it'll just come out flatter and wider than your slicer expects. And that will also give you some source of error. So you're looking for the balance that's right in the middle where it's just hot enough to spread out to actually like make contact with the layer underneath it or the print bed, but it's not so hot that it's spreading out too much and giving you warping and deformities. Um, so that's nozzle temperature in a nutshell. But to understand bed temperature, we need to take this whole concept a step further and talk about a thing called the glass transition. So earlier I said that the glass that is most commonly found in like window panes and whatnot is a classic example of an amorphous solid. Now I want you guys to go rub your face on the closest window to you. All right, you can pause the video. Just leave me right here. It's fine. I will wait. Okay. So for those of you who actually did it, you'll probably have noticed something interesting. If you didn't do it, you probably went right over your head and you didn't even notice it. But earlier, I said that amorphous solids have some pretty defining traits and characteristics. And the key thing there is that they're usually sticky and soft and they deform really easily. And if you rubbed your face up against the window, you will have noticed that that glass window is quite literally absolutely none of those things. Um, which leads us to the conclusion that glass, the material does not exist as glass, the state of matter. Um, 
so why do we call it glasses? And why do we say that glasses are amorphous solids? And to answer that, it all comes down to temperature, right? So similarly to how water has a melting point in which under that point it is a solid, and then as you raise the temperature, it eventually becomes a liquid. Amorphous solids typically have a thing called a glass transition, where under that they are a regular solid that is rigid and has a well-defined shape and they're not sticky and they don't deform easily. And if they do deform, it's typically what's called an elastic deformation where it'll snap right back to its original shape. But then as soon as you break the glass transition, they immediately become an actual amorphous solid where they're sticky and they want to deform very easily and they don't hold their shape nearly as well. And this is the property we're trying to play with when we're dialing in bed temperature, right? Because if your bed is too cold, then you haven't yet broken the glass transition, which means that after the PLA is extruded, it's not going to continue to be sticky and it's not gonna to continue to be soft and like fill in all of the little textured dots on your print bed. It's just gonna like sit there and not be sticky hardly at all. And on the flip side, if you, again, if you have it too high, you risk warping and it's too runny and it deforms too much. So your goal is to basically break the glass transition by a couple of degrees and that's it. And, and that's literally the goal of bed temperature. So yeah, that's pretty much all the theory you guys need to know to actually understand bed adhesion. And with that out of the way, let's actually come up with a process that will allow us to really dial all of those settings in based on this theory. Okay, so with the theory out of the way, let's talk about the process for really dialing in the first layer, okay? And this process is kind of gonna be divided up into two parts. There's the setup portion, and then there's the part that you're gonna just continually iterate with. Um, so for the setup portion, the first two things that are really important is clean your bed and level your bed. Like we said previously, there are four things that matter for bed adhesion. You need to have a clean bed, you need to have a level bed, and then you have to have the right nozzle temperature and bed temperature. And so in the iterative part, we're going to be changing one of those things and then reprinting. And if you have to guess about whether or not your bed is clean or level, that's gonna waste a lot of your time. So just do yourself a favor, start off, clean your bed, level your bed. After that, we need to pick good starting points for the nozzle temperature and bed temperature. And these starting points aren't necessarily gonna work, they're just starting points. They should be close-ish. Um, again, it's just time savings. So if your filament happens to come with suggested temperatures for nozzle temperature and or bed temperature, probably a good place to start. They they're, should hopefully be pretty close. Um, if not, or you don't trust them for some reason, what I usually like to do is I will take the 3D printer, not the slicer, like literally on the 3D printer, dial the nozzle temperature up to 200 and try to feed the filament as if I'm like loading a new roll. And 200 is usually too cold. And so I'll bump it up to 205 and somewhere between 205 and 215, I'll actually get it to start feeding. And that's a decent starting point. Uh, bed temperature, I just started at 50. You don't necessarily want either of those things to be too high because if you guess too high, like we could just set nozzle temperature to 135 and bed temperature to 75 and call it a day. But you're probably gonna end up with warping if you do that. So again, you know, set them lower and let's work our way up to find a temperature that's just good enough. After you do that, you're gonna wanna grab whatever your bed level test is. Um, again, the link to the one that I use is in the description, but if you've got one that you've used before, like please use that one use whatever you're comfortable with, do a test print and take a picture. We're gonna be taking pictures along this whole process. And the whole idea is that whenever you iterate and you tweak a setting and you need to know if it's better or worse than a previous print, you have a picture of the previous print to actually compare it to. Um, so take a picture of your starting point and then we're ready to actually move into the iterative phase. And the iterative phase is pretty straightforward, all right? you're going to tweak one of the four parameters that we said goes into bed adhesion. And then from there, you're going to do a test print and then you're going to compare it with the results of the previous one. And if your change moved you in the right direction, if it gave you a better result, you accept the change, you take a picture and you start over. And if your change didn't do anything or if your change actually made it worse, then you're obviously going to discard it and start over and you're just going to keep iterating and tweak one thing, see what it does, accept or discard it, 
repeat, all right? And again, try to take, every time you accept a change, take a picture of it so you can compare it to the next one. And the whole idea is that this is almost just like an AI search algorithm, right? Because if we know that it has to be one of these four things and you're constantly discarding the one that doesn't work, you could literally just go down the line and do clean, didn't help, level, didn't help, nozzle temperature, helped, clean, didn't help, level, didn't help, nozzle temperature, didn't help, bed, hey, it helped. And you could just like one by one by one try all of them and you'll eventually get something that works. Now, the problem is that that's going to take forever, right? Like for me, yeah, every one of these test prints was 10 minutes. So if I'm iterating all four of them just to make one step in the right direction, then it's like almost an hour, that's 40 minutes just to make a little bit of progress. And so this is where, again, start by cleaning and leveling your printer because then you only have two things to focus on and not four. That being said, it is important to keep in mind that four things matter because once you've done five or six tests, if you try bed temperature and you try nozzle temperature, neither one help you might need to re-clean or re-level the print bed, but also keep in mind that counts as a change. So you're going to clean the print bed and try again without changing anything else, or you're going to re-level it and try again without changing anything else. And that's something I had to do. I actually got myself into a corner where I had to re-level the print bed because nothing was helping, um, but we'll get to that in a minute. I'm gonna show you guys like exactly how I applied this process so you've got an example. Um, but yeah, so you basically just keep iterating and you're gonna get there eventually. And it's gonna be reasonably quick given that we've eliminated the whole bed is level, bed is clean thing. Um, the only other really piece of advice that I have for you guys is make sure that at some point you break the glass transition. I've occasionally gotten filaments to stick before and the first layer to look pretty good and my bed temperature is still below the glass transition and those are usually the prints that will fail in further layers. So if you get stuck or at least as a check mark by the very end, make sure that you break the glass transition. And you'll know that you'll do this because if you're using my kind of print, when you go to peel the dots off the print bed, if you haven't broken the glass transition, it'll look something like this, where you'll go to like peel the dot off and once it actually pops off the print bed, it'll mostly return to its flat shape, right? There might be a five, 10 degree deflection in it, but it's pretty much flat. And after you've broken the glass transition point, it'll end up looking like this because the filament is fundamentally softer as it came off the bed and then it hardened. So you'll end up with a lot of deflection. So yeah, make sure that at some point you break the glass transition because you're probably gonna have to just to make it look right. But if you get to the end and you haven't explicitly checked that, make sure that you check that because that'll give you issues later. But yeah, so let me walk you guys through how I used this process. I literally did this to make this video. So I started off with the nozzle at 200 and the bed at 50, and I tried to feed the plastic through and it didn't feed. I couldn't get it to smoothly come out without a ton of force and even then smoothly was an exaggeration. So I went to 205 and it still didn't feed smoothly and I got to 210 and I could push it through and get it to feed about right. So I did a test print at 210 and with the bed at 50. And this is what it came out looking like. All right, so I had one dot that had failed entirely and two that were deformed and two that were actually pretty okay. So that's not a horrible starting point. Um, I said that the cause of failure was wisping and the filament didn't spread out enough, all right? So if you, you can actually see the print bed through the filament and there were definitely a lot of wisps in it, which led me to believe that it was nozzle temperature. Um, so I increased the nozzle temperature to 215. I left the bed at 50 and that was the only thing I changed. And at that point, I had three that were deformed because they had the little loops sticking off of them, but all five printed relatively successfully. So that was a definite improvement. At that point, I said that the cause of failure was probably a similar thing. I also noticed that there was lifting and globbing on the perimeter, which again, globbing can sometimes be a like nozzle too cold kind of thing. So I increased the nozzle temperature to 220 and left the bed at 50 again and it pretty much gave me the exact same result. So I went back to the 215 for 50 and I increased the bed temperature to 55. And this time I actually got three clean loops. I only had a slight glass transition so I knew that it wasn't hot enough yet. Um, I also noted that, you know, between the perimeter and the deformities that I was still seeing, I was really tempted to clean the bed, particularly where the perimeter was messed up. And I kind of wanted to re-level it because those traces were still looking a little thin. Um, but 
I wanted to fix the glass transition first. I wanted to get above that glass transition, and so I wasn't gonna touch anything else except for the bed temperatures. So I did another print, and this time nozzle 215, bed 60. I had one of the pieces was deformed, but they all had glass transitioned when I like actually peeled them off the bed, and the perimeter was still broken. I knew that the perimeter being broken wasn't the result of the bed being below the glass transition, so I re-leveled the printer, and that was the only thing I changed. So I, I, after I leveled it, I ran another print at 215 and 60, and saw that there was a couple of slight wisps here and there, but the perimeter was absolutely flawless. The traces were a little bit thicker, but they still had a couple gaps in them. So between that and the wisping, um, I noted that it was an improvement. So I increased the nozzle temperature and did another print, this time at 220 and 60. So nozzle 220, bed 60. The discs were completely opaque. I had one very minor deformation, but they all looked really good. So I bumped the nozzle up to 225 and the bed at 60, and it came out pretty much as good as you can expect. So I, I literally took this process from the nozzle was too cold to even feed the filament and the bed was barely hot enough to get anything to stick all the way through like a nice, just about flawless first layer. Um, and that is the goal because again, if you have that first layer, you're good. It's gonna stick to the bed. Like that first layer was stuck onto the bed. Everything on top of that would have stuck to it and we're good to go. So yeah, that's that's really the process behind the first layer. It's gonna be time consuming. It took me, what is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine takes. Each take was about 10 minutes. So it took me an hour and a half plus re-leveling, which probably only was another five, 10 minutes. So about an hour and a half, but that first layer is perfect. And I have those settings saved off for that specific roll of filament. So I know that whenever I go to print something on that filament, these settings should be good, at least as far as bed adhesion in the first layer goes. Okay, so I know that the vast majority of this video focused on the first layer of your print and how it affects bed adhesion. And to be fair, again, like that's kind of the critical moment. If your first layer didn't adhere to the bed, the rest of the print is just not gonna happen. But on the off chance that your first layer looks fine and it's still breaking off the build plate while printing later layers, um, there, there's a few things we can look at. The first one is to make sure it's actually a bed adhesion issue. Obviously, if it's like breaking off, but it's not breaking off on the bed, like if part of your print is still on the bed and it broke further up, that's, that's not a bed adhesion video. This video doesn't apply to you. Sorry that you're like, 20 something minutes in, but like it, it, it stuck to the bed fine. It's just not sticking to itself. So that's a totally separate issue. We can talk about that later, but assuming it is like you get through layer 50 or 60 and then it breaks off the bed. The two really big things that you can look at are these. First one is, again, I'm gonna harp on this. Make sure your first layer looks good. Do a level test, make sure it looks good. And when you go to actually pull the bed level test off the printer, again, hopefully it's only one layer make sure that you actually broke the glass transition. Because if it looks good, but you didn't break the glass transition, you don't have as much adhesive power as you could. And then secondly, from there, take a look at how much surface area your print actually has on the print bed, especially in relationship to the overall surface area that you're printing, as well as its center of mass, all right? If you're, especially if you're printing something with overhangs or like minifigures, if it has a very small contact with the print bed compared to like the rest of the volume of the thing, that's not good. And especially if the center of gravity of the thing that you're printing isn't at least bounded by the first layer on the print bed, um, that's gonna give you issues, right? So if, if you fall into that category where you just don't have enough surface area touching the print bed on your first layer, there's a few things you can do. Most slicing software will allow you to add a brim and brims are really, really great ways to just add a little bit of surface area. You can literally go in and just say, hey, I want an extra three to five millimeter outline around the first layer and it'll go into the first layer and on every edge of the first layer, it'll just add three to five millimeters. So it's a great way to just increase the surface area of that first layer. Another thing is if you're printing with supports, like if you're printing a thing that, in which the surface doesn't directly contact the bed, make sure that you actually 
print with a raft and make sure you print with a raft that's big enough, right? So if you're having adhesion issues, just make the raft a little bit bigger. And if you're printing something directly on the print bed, try to pick the biggest face and put that face down, put that face on the print bed. And that's not always gonna be possible, right? Like sometimes the biggest face will cause issues with supports or overhangs or bridges later. Or sometimes you need like the striping of the layers to be in a specific orientation for mechanical or other reasons. Um, but of the faces available to you, print with the biggest one down. And so yeah, as, as long as you have a really good first layer, and especially if you've broken the glass transition, and then from there, if you have enough surface area on the print bed, you're almost never going to run into bed adhesion issues in later layers. And if you guys uh, do run into bed adhesion issues in later layers, and you followed this guide, then hit me up in the comments. I'd be really interested to see what kind of issues you guys are running into, and I'd love to try to address them in the comment section as well as in future videos. So yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. Um, if it helped you out, then definitely drop a like on it. I've got some other good videos floating around here too, so take a look to see if there's anything that interests you. Um, if you have any other tips as well, if there's anything that I missed, please share them with me in the comment section. I'd love to learn something from you guys, and you also might be able to help each other out, which would be really awesome to see. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the video too, if you need forgiveness for using glue or tape and you haven't yet repented in the comments section, this is your last chance to do so, all right? We all make mistakes and you will be forgiven. Other than that, um, I obviously took the time last month to go through and update all of my branding graphics and that went really well. Um, so this month I've been focusing on social media. So if you guys want to just generally know what I'm up to, right? Know when I post videos, know when I'm streaming something, then definitely hit me up on Twitter for notifications for that. And if you actually wanna interact with me more, um, Discord is the place to do that. I would love to get advice from you guys for upcoming videos before I post them or hopefully before I even record them. Um, I'd love to talk with you about upcoming streams, maybe get suggestions about which games I should play. Um, and if you just wanna make memes and shit posts with me, that that's the place to do it pretty much. Um, I would love to do more engineering live streams and I'd love to get to a point where I could start dreaming bigger and doing some really cool stuff. And it's gonna be a really slow process, but that's gonna be a really key part of how we get there. So yeah, I appreciate any support you guys can give me. And until the next video, you know right where to find me.